Good morning or good afternoon or whatever time it's going to be when you watch this. Jeff and Rod, thanks uh, for the invitation to speak again at Low Carb Denver. This is uh, a favorite meeting for me and the first one um, that I ever did uh, with regards to uh, uh, public audiences or public talks. Um, I wish I could be there to do this in person, but this will be, I think, an acceptable um, substitution. Uh, what I wanted to speak to, uh, was to speak to you about was this idea of someone transitioning or the body making this transition from uh, insulin resistance to type 2 diabetes. And so we'll look at what goes on in the body to flip that switch, if you will, and then in, in moving uh, from one disease state to a more exaggerated disease state. Now, my disclosures, um, I used to have none, but it just goes to show how relevant things are getting in the realm of metabolic health. I have a book um, that I will receive royalties from that is released later this year about insulin resistance, which is a topic I'll speak about today. I'm a scientific advisor for a health insurance group, that's United, a uh, health insurance company, United Health Group, and a supplement company called Unicity, and then I'm a, a co-owner um, in a company called, or co-founder in a company called Health Code. And, and we make a low carb, high fat, high protein shakes uh, and, um, uh, to, to facilitate optimal metabolic health. Having said all this, I obviously have a, pr a dietary preference that I adhere to, which is a low carb diet. And uh, that should be considered uh, in my disclosure. Now with that, uh, let's get into the science. Uh, diabetes is one of the most common disorders uh, within the US and one of the most lethal, uh, uh, accounting or taking the seventh spot with regards to uh, le its, its mortality. Now, I believe this is somewhat deceiving uh, because diabetes has its hand in many other diseases that both go down or up <clears throat> on this list. Diabetes is the leading cause of kidney disease, of course. Uh, most, many, I'll say, instances of heart disease are derived from diabetes. Certain cancers are significantly greater um, likelihood um, and the mortality goes up with, with um, diabetes like pro uh, breast and prostate cancers. Stroke and even Alzheimer's disease, sometimes referred to as type 3 diabetes, are also related. So I think that the true statistics highlighting the lethality of diabetes um, are much more uh, compelling than perhaps at uh, face value. So if this is a disease that is so relevant, uh, it is lethal, and, and as I make the case, causing so many other disorders, we need to understand it. And to understand type 2 diabetes, we have to appreciate the foundation upon which it is built, and that is insulin resistance. Type 2 diabetes is essentially a prolonged state of insulin resistance, and I'll define that in a little more detail. But just to set the stage here, and I, I regret that my little video insert is going to cut some of this off. This was a study published at the end of last year <clears throat> that found that 88% of adults in the U.S. are considered metabolically unfit. And to come to this classification, they looked at the five metrics of, of metabolic health um, being as indicated here, waist circumference, so an ideal waist circumference, an ideal blood pressure, HDL and triglycerides, and then as well as blood glucose. These were the five metrics they looked at. Now, only 12%, in other words, to present the, their findings in another way, of adults, only 12% of adults were um, good or, or considered healthy in all five of these outcomes, this, this constellation of, of good health in this case. However, uh, in this, uh, with these five things in mind, a lack of these five, not even all five of them, is what constitutes the metabolic syndrome. And, and that's what they were doing. They were looking at the, the constellation of disorders that are connected to the metabolic syndrome and then using that as a gauge of metabolic health. 
Now, what is so relevant about this is that metabolic syndrome is the current name of a disease that used to be called the insulin resistance syndrome. And rightly so, insofar as each of these disorders can in some way be connected or, or derivative from insulin resistance. <clears throat> and I won't take the time to go into that. That's not the purpose of my talk. I'm just simply establishing the relevance of insulin resistance. And when it comes to the metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance is profoundly relevant. In fact, I would argue it's the most relevant um, a variable. But insulin resistance has its hand in many more disorders. Here are some of the big ones, uh, body fat levels, body fat regulation, diabetes, as I've already indicated, heart disease, which is an umbrella term for numerous disorders of the cardiovascular system, certain cancers, and fatty liver disease. But there are more, like uh, in certain forms of infertility, polycystic ovarian syndrome in women at its core is a disease of insulin and insulin altering the production of sex hormones from the ovaries. Erectile dysfunction, there's a study to suggest that it's the most, uh, one of the earliest symptoms of insulin resistance in men. And then uh, uh, some neurological disorders like migraines and Alzheimer's disease, and then some other disorders like stroke and arthritis. And indeed there are many more that I just don't have the room to include here. So insulin resistance has its hand in essentially every non-infectious chronic disease. So we want to understand it in order to truly understand the ideology of these disorders. Now to put things in perspective, <clears throat> here along the x-axis, I have, I have time. And by that, I mean the, the lifetime of an individual. I'm not talking minutes or hours here. I mean, I mean years. And then glucose is in yellow and insulin in green. And over the course of someone's life, what would happen is this spike in insulin or the steady climb in insulin or, well, steady, uh, uh, but, but earlier. So this earlier um, rise in insulin and then an eventual rise in glucose. And it is so important to appreciate that these two molecules insulin and glucose do not move hand in hand over the lifetime of an individual. Too often we think they do. And so we look at glucose and we think we're getting an understanding of insulin, but that is not necessarily the case, not at all. Now there's two important points that I wanna draw here. The first point, that first hashed line is really and, and everything encompassed in it from line one to line two, that is what I, I want us to look at as, an ins, as insulin resistance. That is when the body is insulin resistant. And you'll notice <clears throat> that this is a state of fairly normal glucose and yet not normal insulin. So insulin resistance is defined as a state that is hyperinsulinemic but normal glycemic. In contrast, beyond that line, we now move into the realm of type 2 diabetes. And this is now finally when the body is so resistant to its own insulin, indeed, even when insulin is elevated, which it is throughout the life of the type 2 diabetic, even when it starts to come down, and we'll come to that later, it still gets, uh, it is still higher than what it is in a normal individual. It's just lower than it used to be. And so commonly, this reduction in insulin um, the, the scientific literature will say insulin is insufficient to control glucose, but that shouldn't be mistaken for insulin is absent. It just means the body isn't, no, isn't making as much as it was before, potentially, and even if it is on this front end of the insulin drop, it's just not enough to control the glucose, and thus we see that rise in glucose, and then we identify the disease as type 2 diabetes. I believe there's power in this paradigm because if we can acknowledge this early rise in insulin, we can detect the progression towards type 2 diabetes potentially much, much sooner. So what is it that flips the switch? What is it that makes that glucose start to climb um, when the insulin has been elevated for so long fighting this quiet war? Well, let's get into it. <clears throat> In fact, I'm going to present it to you in the context of different tissues. Insulin resistance, starting with a disorder of the adipose tissue, 
and then type 2 diabetes or the glucose spike um, really settling in when we have disorders of muscle and liver and pancreas. And we'll go in that order, but let's start with uh, a, a, really a common um, background or, or understanding that in each instance of these tissues um, failing or, or contributing to this progression towards type 2 diabetes, insulin resistance is the underlying disorder. Each of these tissues becomes insulin resistant, and that's part of its um, pathology, and we'll get into that um, in more detail. Now, very briefly, <clears throat> because I'm not, the purpose of this talk is not to define insulin resistance, it's to identify the transition from insulin resistance to type 2 diabetes, but I just wanted to briefly show my perspective here in, in how we are driving the insulin resistance in these tissues. Hyperinsulinemia, as much as this is debated, is very well documented to directly drive insulin resistance in adipose and muscle. And by mass on the person, insulin resistance at these two, two tissues really matters. And I'll come back to the relevance of this in the muscle in the progression towards type 2 diabetes in just a moment. But the little the references I have here, those are the PubMed IDs, and of course anyone can look this up. I just want us to have a mutual understanding that despite the debate, um, there is direct evidence. This, this shouldn't be debated. The evidence is very, very clear. Hyperinsulinemia can drive insulin resistance. Now, there are other causes that have little to do with insulin, at least directly. Cortisol can directly cause, or, or a glucocorticoid, a cortisol-like um, drug, like dexamethasone, um, that can directly drive insulin resistance, and so too can inflammation. Now, these are not related. Uh, hyperinsulinemia is not the same as cortisol, and neither of those is the same as inflammation. These are all distinct, at least in their origins. However, there is nevertheless, once again, a common um, territory here, <clears throat> and that is that each of these molecules, high insulin, cortisol, and inflammation, drive the accumulation or, or facilitate the accumulation of a molecule called ceramides. And ceramides is one of, the, um, one of the type of lipids that is made within a cell. Uh, now, so I'm just introducing ceramides as a common um, uh, root or, or touchstone for each of these distinct origins when it comes to insulin resistance. So let's look at those three tissues, um, the muscle, the liver, and the pancreas and see how they drive the hyperglycemia. But let's start with the muscle because the muscle is the elephant in the room. It is the main consumer of glucose. Um, indeed, it consumes up to 80% of the glucose in the body. So we need the muscle to be working for that glucose sink to be at our disposal to clear the glucose from the blood and thus mitigate the progression towards type 2 diabetes. What's interesting, of course, with the muscle is that it is it generally requires insulin for glucose uptake. Now there's an exception to that, which is when the muscle is contracting, but I won't get into that right now. Insulin facilitates glucose uptake, certainly when the muscle is at rest, which let's admit it, um, people spend most of the day doing, even active people. <clears throat> However, with insulin resistance, this insulin facilitated glucose uptake is compromised, and then we have a reduction, up to 50% reduction in glucose uptake in an insulin-resistant muscle. Again, this matters. When we're talking about a tissue that accounts for up to 80% of all glucose uptake, if we lose half of that ability, we now have glucose in the blood that is, well, lingering. It's struggling to find a place to be used. <clears throat> and naturally, of course, this results in an increase in blood glucose. And so if we look at this paradigm again of this insulin resistance prog progressing towards type 2 diabetes, we shift the line a bit. We're moving closer into the realm of type 2 diabetes. <clears throat> now the liver. The liver, I believe, is one of the unsung heroes or unappreciated heroes when it comes to um, uh, human metabolism. And there are two processes I want to highlight, and that is the liver's ability to both make lipid and to make glycogen the storage form of glucose. So it's the liver's, one of the, one of the tricks the liver has 
to once, once uh, glucose has been pulled in, it will um, store it. So it's just a way to help um, buffer the glucose levels in the blood. If glucose levels are high, the liver can pull in some of that more than what it needs for its own energy demands. And then when glucose goes low, the liver can break that glycogen down and share it with the blood or with the body. So that's the de definitions there, the production of fat and the production of, of glycogen. Insulin, of course, as it has its hand in so many things, also has its hand in these events as well. In particular, it stimulates both of them. Insulin will both st stimulate the production of lipid and the production of glycogen. With insulin resistance in the liver, there's an interesting phenomenon, and it is reflective of the fact that insulin resistance is not just a global effect within the cell. It is not that every event that insulin used to do is not happening. And, and let me get into that to, just to make that clear. When the liver is insulin resistant, lipogenesis is still activated when insulin comes knocking at the door, so to speak, when insulin binds its insulin receptor. So to make that clear, even if the liver is insulin resistant, insulin can still stimulate lipogenesis. In contrast, in the insulin resistant liver, insulin is less able to make glycogen. So it's less able to tell the liver to store glucose. And this loss of stimulating glycogenesis means we have a reduction. We actually end up, insulin loses its ability to prevent the breakdown of glycogen. So now we have glycogenolysis. This event is disrupted in insulin resistance. And so now we have a liver that is supposed to be holding on to glucose. It's actually letting it go, but it's not supposed to. Remember, that's the pathology here. Insulin is trying to stimulate, or it ought to be stimulating glucose uptake and storage. It's not working anymore. So the liver doesn't get the signal not to break down glycogen. And so it does. It's not being inhibited, the glycogenolysis. And this, of course, drives up blood glucose levels. So once again, if we look at this paradigm of the progression towards full-blown type 2 diabetes, with the liver being insulin resistant, we've pushed that a little further down the road. The patient has progressed, progressed a little further towards full-blown type 2 diabetes. So they're getting this mounting hyperglycemia. <clears throat> now, in the paradigm or in the progression I'm presenting, let's just say the pancreas is the last to fall. And to talk about the pancreas, we need to introduce two distinct characters or aspects of it. And that is the pancreatic alpha cells and the pancreatic beta cells. Now these are so relevant because they each produce a pancreatic yin and yang. And insulin and glucagon represent this really one of the many instances of a delicate orchestra within the body when it comes to especially endocrinology, this ebb and flow of hormones that work together to maintain homeostasis. And in one aspect of that, although there are many more, insulin and glucagon work together in this tug of war to control blood glucose levels. <clears throat> glucagon attempting to increase blood glucose all the time and insulin, if it had its way, attempting to lower blood glucose all the time. Now in this relationship, which maybe we could say is somewhat abusive, insulin is the dominant uh, one here. Insulin is inhibiting glucagon release from the alpha cell. So when the beta cell is making insulin, it is depressing alpha cell glucagon secretion. However, uh, well, and that would act normally to lower blood glucose by suppressing glucagon, helping insulin win that war of controlling blood glucose and ultimately reducing it. However, with insulin resistance, this phenomenon is compromised. Insulin's ability to inhibit alpha cell glucagon release is compromised. And that's because the alpha cell, as I have indicated, is what becomes insulin resistant. When it experiences insulin resistance, it doesn't get the signal to stop producing glucagon. And thus the glucagon is if not normal, it's beyond normal. So when insulin is elevated, trying to lower blood glucose, glucagon isn't listening anymore. It's, it's a naughty child here and it's just doing whatever it wants to. So once again, with this paradigm in mind, the insulin resistance of the alpha cell 
pushes the person towards this mounting hyperglycemia and they're one step further to full-blown type 2 diabetes. But the story's not done when it comes to the pancreas because there's more to say about the beta cell. And in fact, it's appropriate to end um, this discussion of, of the problems in the tissues with the beta cell because it appears to be so relevant here. Now with the beta cell, there is debate and there is no consensus with regards to what is it about the beta cell that is altered. Is it the number of beta cells or is it the beta cell's ability to produce insulin itself? So in other words, the beta cells are there and they're just no longer attempting to control blood glucose and the production of insulin has gone down. And again, there is, there is debate here. Uh, uh, so in, in this case, whereas insulin is normally attempting to lower the blood glucose levels, the loss of either beta cell number or insulin overall production resulting in a lower than previous insulin level means blood glucose levels start to climb. But again, let me emphasize that blood insulin levels don't go low. Um, they don't become deficient. They are still elevated higher than what you'd see in a normal non-type a type 2 diabetic. It's just not enough to control the glucose in that person anymore because they're so insulin resistant. Now, whether it was a beta cell problem or an insulin problem, the deficiency relatively um, in either of them results in that increased glucose and pushing the diabetes further. It ultimately will say to the end, it's full-blown type 2 diabetes now. Now, I would slightly make the case that it is perhaps more a matter of just insulin production itself because there are, and I have these studies linked here, instances of what is referred to as a beta cell reversal. And just within a week, um, we see that there's a normalization of insulin production with different lifestyle interventions. And so, um, but you could certainly say the beta cells themselves are bouncing back and um, they are proliferating within the course of a week. But regardless of which one it is, we can be quite comfortable that the beta cells are not irreversibly gone like we would have in type 1 diabetes. In type 2, there appears to be some room for correction. In fact, ample room for correction to help um, reverse this trend. And so <clears throat> with this proper intervention, blood glucose levels can start to come down and we can start to reverse and, and push back the clock, so to speak, with regards to the mounting hyperglycemia and the type 2 diabetes. So to kind of sum it all up, Type 2 diabetes is built on a foundation of insulin resistance. And this insulin resistance manifests in key distinct tissues. The adipose tissue first, I, I would I, I submit, uh, and that's what ultimately starts the insulin resistance typically, although there, it could happen elsewhere. But in typical insulin resistance, I'd make the case that it starts in the adipose tissue. And then this, uh, with the adipose being the first to fall, other tissues sh uh, fall shortly after, um, so to speak, and become insulin resistant. The muscle, the liver, and then the pancreas. And again, a common mediator across all of these very distinct tissues is the accumulation of this lipid called ceramides. In every one of these, whether it was the alpha cell or the beta cell in the pancreas, whether it's the liver, muscle, or adipose, ceramides are a known inducer or antagonist of the insulin signal with regards to the, the biochemical pathway of insulin. Now, I'm not there to answer any questions. Um, Rod and Jeff will answer all of them for me. Um, and uh, guys, I, I appreciate uh, the time you took to watch this, and I certainly appreciated the opportunity to share some of what I know about insulin resistance and diabetes. Thank you.